Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so let's uh, take a little peek here and we're looking at our next topic of uh, discussion in terms of the world of absolutism with the one, the only, Louis the XIV. Uh, this lively looking dude here showing off his uh, calves and he is going to be the epitome of absolutism through the uh, era of the 17th and 18th centuries. And so we're going to kind of do a little, little review on absolutism, kind of backtrack a little bit to period one. Then we're going to take a look at Louis and see why he is the example of absolutism, all right? So to start off here, um, you know, remember that there's a lot of stuff happening in terms of this time period, in terms of the 17th century, 1600s. One of the biggest things that kind of gets forgotten and historians will debate a lot about is the idea of a quote-unquote little ice age. Uh, through research, uh, through scientific study, uh, it's been shown that the temperature was an average of two to three degrees colder during a good chunk of the 16th, uh, 17th century than it was before or after. And so they call it a little ice age. Uh, with this little ice age came some agricultural problems. Uh, farm fields weren't producing as much, growing seasons were not as long, crops were freezing out, and there was less food. Typically, when there's less food, and people are hungry, they get a little cranky, a little, cranky, a little hangry, if you will. And um, there's a problem with this, right? Less food means less happy people cause more trouble. Also, governments, as we saw with the English, spend more money, whether it be on their own lavish uh, living styles, like uh, James I's wardrobe, or on armies and fighting wars. The question is, where does that money come from? There is yet to be a mystical, magical money tree. It comes from taxing the poor. And so that's where they end up getting money from. And so these taxes start raising on the poor, which start causing problems for everybody else. Um, you do see the papacy and kind of that lines of the, uh, the Reformation to where you have the Catholic and the Protestant faiths. And it's national churches in the German states with the Peace of Westphalia, the establishment of Catholic or Lutheran or Calvinist states, the Anglican Church in England as well, all examples of that. Remember, the idea of absolute power is absolutism. They run they reign by the idea of divine right. Um, it's uh, kind of the idea that God says, I am the ruler. And so that's kind of what their idea of divine right is. We'll look at it more in terms of Louis uh, later on. But divine right of kings is a big idea here that um, Marx at this time said, I am the ruler because God essentially says, I am the ruler. Um, by doing that, monarchs will control the church. We see examples of that in Francis I, Concord Babylonia. We see examples of that with Henry VIII. They establish their own law courts. Think of Henry VII and the Star Chamber. The idea of freedom and liberties and what gets abolished and not abolished. Uh, looking at Oliver Cromwell is a great example here uh, in terms of what he allows people to do or not do. The idea of permanent armies and police and spies. We saw armies that worked in uh, England. We'll see armies in France that are developed for uh, professional permanent armies. You have the Spider King, Louis X in France, for the Valois dynasty of doing, using police and spies, those kind of things. Essentially, ladies and gentlemen, everything is focused on the monarch. They are the state. Um, and a do a quick little flashback here in France. As France is our focus, um, we have Henry IV. Here's Henry IV, Henry Navarre. Um, who kind of laid the laid the groundwork, you will, of of absolutism. Remember, he's the guy who said Paris is worth a mass. He'll convert from uh, being a Huguenot to being a uh, Catholic. All those kind of things. Now, it's not quite totalitarian. People ask me this in class, like, well, is this the same as being a dictator? Not quite, right? You don't have total control, all right? Uh, there's not total control here. It does foreshadow a little bit. Obviously, the glorification of the state. Glorification of the monarch over all other things. Think like, you know, Kim Jong-un in uh, North Korea, that kind of deal. That is a part of it, okay? Use of war, all that kind of stuff. A big part of it. Um, but uh, the Duke of Sully, who's the dude with the awesome beard here, the bald head, as well as Henry the Henry Navarre, Henry the Fourth, they do lay the, the foundation for this absolutist idea. So here are a few things. The idea, right, is keeping down the nobles. If I'm an absolute monarch, I need to find a way to keep down the nobles and at the same time, Keep the people happy. So one way that Duke of Sully helped out Henry, Henry of the Fourth was by reviving the, the we call the Paulet tax, the tax on her, her, hereditary positions. So 
if I'm a noble, I'm being taxed because I am a noble, right? I that that title of sir gets me an extra tax going on. You know, you want to be happy though through a highway and also help your military system that way. Um, you know, taxes on salts, taxes on sales, money comes in that way, um, and that kind of stuff works. It actually, you know, the number of taxes decline, revenues increase. You know. There are a lot of ways to kind of trick the system, right? So you got rid of some taxes on the people, but then raised others. It looks like you have less taxes. In the end, you actually are bringing more money in. Now, when Henry dies, you have Marie de' Medici, who ruled for the boy king Louis the uh, Thirteenth. And we talked about Cardinal Michel, you already uh, early on, early on during the Thirty Years' War. Just remind you about him. Here he is in all his cardinal glory. How he essentially was that first ever prime minister type person for the boy king Louis the Thirteenth. And how he kind of the idea of of that um, pragmatic uh, pr pragmatist style ruling, where he's saying, you know, we're going to try and focus on uh, our politique, focusing on, uh, you know, make the country better. So he did things like, you know, making sure everyone's following the monarchy and keeping the nobles weak, checking the nobility, making sure they're not getting too powerful in the taxes, and you know, trying to take down the Habsburgs to make them more more powerful. So obviously, remember we wrote about the idea of political tax. We read parts of that already. Um, and we can't check that out and remove myself over here. There we go. Um, a good quote to look at here. We've kind of started out already about political testament. You know, power is based on revenue. See the rise of mercantilism, all those ideas um, that French marks French marks can't ta can't tax at will. They have to get control from the from the parliament, the states, the estates general. We have this idea of, of uh, raison d'état, which is you know what is done for the state is done for God. In a way, by the cardinal being here, he kind of links here the idea of the of the church and the state. Kind of gives a good reason for people to put extra money and do extra things, um, all those kind of deals to it. So here we see our little Quio picture here. This is Louis XIII, his wife, Queen of Austria, and a little kid, Louis XIV. Now, here's the deal. Um, Louis XIII, they had a lot of trouble having a kid. They had a lot of troubles in terms of conceiving. So the way when Louis XIV was born, he was considered like miracle baby kind of deal. So he was literally showered as a gift from God because he was that male heir. Uh, and so they wanted that male heir for the longest time, had trouble getting one. They got one a la, you know, Henry VIII, right? And um, all of a sudden, after that little baby's born, though, right, you have both Cardinal Richelieu and, and Louis XIII both die. Now, Richelieu did appoint a new uh, cardinal, okay, Jules Mazarin, as his successor. So there's another cardinal kind of continuing that line of uh, – Cardinals that are kind of that filling that prime minister role and advising the king. So obviously you have Queen Anne of Austria with her kind of acting as regent for their infant son Louis XIV, who is right here looking all kind of creepy like. Uh, but he was considered this miracle baby. So here he is, you know, his miracle baby goodness, chilling out, showing off those awesome calves again. You notice this pose a lot with Louis as he goes earlier, earlier, early, early on. Now even though Louis is this young king, right? He has a very, very rough life. Um, one of the things that happened was that because of Richelieu's policies and taxing, keeping the nobles down, he kind of ticked the nobles off a little bit. And nobles were a little feisty about stuff right now. They were not very happy. And so when the king dies and Richelieu dies, they have a new inexperienced uh, uh, person in office. They have a young boy king, a, a queen as regent. The nobles see their opening. They're like, you know what? We're going to have a civil war. We're going to try and take back our power. They call the civil war the Fronde. The front happens for about five years, from 1648 to 1653, all while Louis is a boy king. And so there's this war between the king, quote-unquote, and the nobility. Uh, essentially, this fight that's going on. Now, obviously, it's not the real king because he's, like, you know, seven years old. Um, and there was a lot of violence that happened here. And at times, what happened was that they actually had to take the king, the Queen Anne and Karl Marzron, took the king and got him out of Paris for fear of his life. Um and when the king was, and when they were caught taking little Louis out of Paris, it kind of freaked people up because they're questioning, like, is the king really here? Is the little king dead? Is it a chance for us to take over? All those kind of things are going on here over the course of the Civil War. To a point where the nobles would actually come into little King Louis's bedchamber, right, as he was sleeping, pull his covers back all night long and pray through just to make sure there was still a king saying, is there a legit king yet, or are we taking this place over? Um, it was very, very traumatic for Louis. If you imagine being a little nine-year-old and having people walk into your room and, like, stare at you and make sure you're alive and all that kind of stuff, this was kind of a big, scary deal. Um, 
And so there are always problems that happen because, one, the nobility has a lot of power yet. And Louis has never forgiven the nobility and try to keep them down. He also never forgets that trauma is literally scarred for life by the trauma he's induced during the front. And the economy is also ruined because of taxes, all those other problems for years go forward. So as Louis gets older now, he reaches his height, and eventually what happens is uh, Cardinal Marzan will die, uh, and Louis will take over directly, and he'll start controlling it as a, as a young king. Um, and he definitely takes control, of direct control of the economy, takes direct, direct control of the government, and essentially brings absolute of the part in. Now, one of the things that Louis said about himself is that he essentially starts with uh, France and ends with France. He called himself the Sun King. As saying, basically, I am France. The sun is it makes the world go. I, as the king, also make France go. And so you see, you're going to see this uh, this label around here all the time about Louis as the Sun King. He also models up after Apollo. A lot of the a lot of the paintings of Louis actually have himself as Apollo, as something he's kind of the, the end all be all the world. As Apollo was a sun god that brought the brought the uh, the sun up. Uh, there are times when you lose a young man where he actually will perform in ballets made directly for him as he is portraying Apollo or being portrayed as the quote-unquote sun king. I understand. Louis XIV ruled for 72 years. He survives all his sons, and his grandson is who will succeed him as Louis XV for a very short period of time in the 1700s. Um, and there's a little quote here that when Louis sneezed, all Europe caught a cold. That basically means that Louis is going to be so influential, he's going to change essentially the height of Europe from the mid-1600s all the way to his death in 1714, 1716. Uh, here is his wife, uh, Maria Teresa of Spain. And that is way, his way of kind of connecting and uh, does a practice of connecting treaties, right? As him marrying into the Spanish royalty, he's going to connect Spain and make that diplomatic arrangement for Spain work and let these two uh, states work together. Um, you know, he truly had absolute control. He had he control over the nobles, he had control over the poor, and he's eventually going to make his, uh, you know, keep control of the poor through very unique ways, especially through using his palace at Versailles. Uh, typically, the palace is always in Paris, right? And the, that way, the nobles had their chance to go to and from uh, the city of Paris, that kind of stuff. Uh, Louis made his nobles live in the palace at Versailles. He made them stay there, almost like kind of a prison to keep them but, but nearby them. And I'll talk more about this later on as to why this was a really, really big deal. I'll uh, tell this palace of Versailles he makes. I um, understand that almost all the rep, over half the revenue of France went into making Versailles. It was ginormous, right? Especially have all the all of the uh, uh, you know all the accoutrements there for the nobles. I understand being noble in France was kind of rough, okay? Uh, he buys a lot of nobles. He creates what are called nobles of kinds, of Roman nobles, if you will. There's the old nobles or nobles of the sword. These old nobles of the sword were the old school nobles, used to be the knights, all that kind of stuff. Louis, is one way to pay for this palace, chooses to make new nobles. And nobility is a big thing here, okay? So you're going to have two types of nobles in France. You have the new – this is terrible. Wow. Okay, you have the new nobles. And you have the old nobles. Old noble, you're a noble because of your name. Okay? And those are the ones that were not big fans of Louis. New nobles, you became a noble because Louis made you a noble. You paid enough money in, and Louis made you a noble. Either way, you both had to be at Versailles. And at Versailles, your job was to basically cater to Louis. You were considered a good person. You get to help hold Louis' candle hold his nightgown for me before he changed. All those kind of things made you uh, high up in Louis' stature. And if you uh, were off on, on his bad side, it meant you didn't get any attention from Louis whatsoever. But here is this, this, this uh, pleasure palace. We call it the Palace at Versailles. And um, it's going to be this huge palace uh, built, essentially used to be a hunting cabin, built outside of Paris to get Louis away from the people, get Louis away from the dangers, light hurt him during the front. And so... Louis here is saying his famous quote, Le Tessus Moi, I am the state. Uh, here's Louis in his later days, once again showing off those level of the calves and the tights there. Uh, right away, Versailles is an example of that. It is all the money of France going to Versailles, all the all nobles being in Versailles, all centered around him. He is the state. So here's an example of it his carriage. Um, here are the Bourbon family crest with him on top here, obviously using the fleur de lis as his symbol. 
Uh, here's examples paintings here showing Louis as Apollo. A lot of paintings in, in, in uh, Versailles will portray Louis this way as the god Apollo. Also, you'll see on a lot of Louis stuff, the sun symbol right here. He has him being the sun king. Now, he did. Uh, here's an example of uh, Maria Teresa and the dolphin. A dolphin being the, uh, the French prince, okay? Uh, not the French prince, but the French prince. Uh, his uh, Louis son. Now, understand how big this palace is. We're going to show you more pictures in a second here. This is how big it was. This is a 2,000-acre palace. It had 12 miles of road just inside the palace itself. It was a staircase, 700 rooms for all of his nobles, um, 50 fountains, 12 miles of walls, a huge canal, rows of trees, 6,000 paintings. It was immense, right? The cost of this cannot be calculated today, ladies and gentlemen. We'll look at more examples later on, but it is insane. Here's Versailles today. You can go and tour Versailles if you'd like to. Um, here's some examples of the grounds of Versailles. You notice the fountains, the trees, all those kind of things as, as part of, of this palace at Versailles. Like I said, originally, this was a hunting cabin, ladies and gentlemen, a hunting cabin. Here's some of the grounds of Versailles. Notice here we have him as, as Apollo again. That Apollo theme comes back again in terms of Louis. And more fountains, and more fountains, and more fountains. Here's his temple of love. Now, speaking of love, Louis had a little deal. Louis liked the ladies. Uh, which we'll get into in a second as well. So um, here's a Hall of Mirrors, one of the biggest uh, attractions to Palace of Versailles. It was literally, as it says, a Hall of Mirrors. People would walk their way up and down the hall every night looking at themselves and showing off their, their best dress. Um, gone are the days of the nobles with knights and, and swords and armor. Now it's uh, pointy shoes and tights. Showing off the Hall of Mirrors and walking up and down, talking to each other, staring at each other, and eating immense amounts of food and drinking immense amounts of alcohol. Essentially, every night at Versailles was a feast and a party uh, for the nobles as they walked up and down this Hall of Mirrors. Here's an interesting fact here is that, you know, here we have the, the bed of the king and queen. Two did stay separately because Louis, as I said, had a thing for the ladies. He had a temple of love for a reason. Louis did have numerous mistresses. Sometimes he would have multiple a night. Uh, supposedly his sexual appetite was off the walls. Um, and there are fun stories of him sneaking out of his room to, you know, keep the appearance, right? Because gods are still, uh, kings are still, you know, have to answer to God yet, and sneaking out, crawling all the gutters of Versailles so he can sneak to his mistress's bedchambers. Um, you think, you know, does a queen know about these mistresses? Yeah, she did. Um, There's sort of how, you know, sometimes King Louis, if he couldn't get his mistress's dress off fast, I would have a little uh, bouncing baba with his servant, and then with his mistress after that. So the phrase is good to be the king, and it can take different ways here, okay? Um, but he did have that, that idea where he had, you know, lots of mistresses, and even, you know, his mistresses had their own parts of the, of the side. Um, here's his chapel. You can kind of see as him being part of the state, him being head of the church, the chapel of the Gallican church being very important there. Here's his opera stage. So King Louis did take opera and ballet very, very seriously, where he actually had his own that he performed in, written for him to perform. And nobles all came and watched him perform in these little ballets. Notice up here is the sun symbol along with his uh, the Bourbon family crest up here. The example of his furniture that you have, a lot of times you see the fleur de lis on there, his symbol. <coughs> his battle just skipped over. Now, the economy is a big part of it. Now, um, he was kind of the model monarch, if you will, for most of, of Europe. And, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Europe took advantage of this idea, this model that he created. They replaced French, created his Latin as language. I mean, you'll see French being spoken in Russia and in the German states because of Louis and because of the example he posed in being, in being a monarch. Um, the problem with Louis got into his money. And uh, the thing is, he appointed a guy named Jean-Baptiste Colbert to control his finances. Now, as long as Colbert was around, life was good until Colbert dies and Louis takes over his finances himself. One of the things that Colbert did was set up the idea of mercantilism. In a way, Colbert is that father mercantilism, making sure that French colonies and their trade serve the state. And so that's why he's kind of the inventor, inventor, if you will, of the idea of mercantilism and works between Spain and France to make that happen. It's all good until he dies because then things start going wrong. Uh, one idea that, that Colbert had was to start popular, uh, populating Canada and make Canada a more popular place. He actually took 4,000 people, mostly women, sent them over to Canada to settle that place. Uh, you could actually volunteer or be paid as a woman to go to Canada and marry a French guy and start a uh, little, have little French babies over in Canada to populate that, that, uh, that county and keep the uh, economy going over there and keep the whole idea of trade going. Um, and so using those counties is a big deal for him. What happens is that, you know, while a commercial class, 
really, really well, agriculture fell apart. Most of your peasants were involved in agriculture. And as Louis is spending money mostly on wars and on his palace, currency started going down the toilet, Colbert dies, the economy starts falling apart. A lot of that goal was never actually obtained for him. And um, last thing Louis does, kind of looks at it, is the idea of in revoking the Edict of Nantes in 1685. Um, remember, the Edict of Nantes created those Huguenot safe zones, if you will, uh, with the Edict of Fontainebleau. Uh, Louis revokes that Edict of Nantes, closes all the Protestant schools, destroys Protestant churches, and basically throws those out who will not exile their Huguenot faith. Now, some of them he does send to Canada, okay? And he has this new rule here of one law, one king, one law, one faith to kind of bring up the idea that he is the state. A lot of the Catholics in, in France absolutely love this, right? They're like, oh my God, Louis, we love you. And that's where we're going to stop. Okay, well, we'll do next video on his wars. I've talked enough today. I appreciate it.